Every day as we walk or jog along the roads of the country, every day as we drive on our way to work past homes built hundreds of years ago, as we sit in worship in our churches, do we ever imagine coming face to face with the myths and legends associated with these places? Over the years, stories of sightings stranger than reality have emerged from the quaint houses and rolling fields of the Washington County area. These stories, derived from the history of this area, were once told to eager audiences as forms of entertainment by storytellers. But now, these stories have been passed on to historians as a verbal record of the past. These stories date back to when Washington County was part of the western frontier and European settlers began making this area their home. The legends and myths of Washington County are all around us. They give us insight into what life was like long ago. It's some of these legends that we'll explore in this program. We'll visit the home of the founder of the city of Hagerstown, as well as the city itself. Then we'll head to South Mountain, near Boonesboro, to see the areas affected by the first battle of the Civil War fought on Union soil. It's all next on Legends. Coming up next, we'll visit the home of Jonathan Hager, the founder of the city of Hagerstown. The Jonathan Hager House has had many residents since it was built in the late 1700s. It's seen many events, and many of those have been long forgotten. Next, we'll tell you which of them haven't. We start our program at the very beginning of Hagerstown itself. The Jonathan Hager House is one of the area's oldest landmarks, and it sits here in Hagerstown City Park. But in the 1700s, this part of Hagerstown looked much different than we see it now. Well, Jonathan Hager bought a 200-acre tract from a man named Daniel Delaney in June of 1739, and we know this because of land records. Daniel Delaney eventually would be the founder of Frederick, Maryland, and he had acquired some 10,000 acres here in the Carmel Valley around 1712. This house is built over two springs. Perhaps there was someone here already using the spring water as their source. But as far as this massive stone dwelling goes, no, I'm sure this was the first major structure at this site. Jonathan Hager wasn't the first settler in this area. Proof of about 100 others before Hager has been found in land deed records. In fact, there were enough settlers in the area to support a grist mill, which was built in 1738, just a mile from Jonathan Hager's home. Soon after purchasing the land, Hager fell in love. Jonathan Hager would eventually marry a neighbor by the name of Elizabeth Kirshner in the year 1740, and that's the year after he built the house. So it's always been believed that Hager gave her this house as a sort of a wedding present. Now, the Kirshner family had already arrived in America in 1731, so they were already established here. I don't believe we know exactly when they came to this particular part of what is now Washington County, Maryland. Uh, I think you'd have to believe that Hager was probably already out here surveying land, determining what land to buy, and run into the people who were already living out here. And at some point, certainly prior to uh, the building of the house, he'd probably already met the young Elizabeth Kirshner. Hager lived in the house until 1745, when he sold it to a man named Jacob Rohr. Jacob and his family lived here until 1758, when his son, also named Jacob, inherited the land and the house. The land and the house changed ownership many times over the years, but has looked virtually the same throughout. The Hager House was originally built as a one-and-a-half-story house, probably by Hager himself. 
the full second floor and the attic were all added at a later point in time. It has been argued whether Hager put the addition on or whether another owner, probably one of the Roars, put the addition on, the elevation that is. We'll probably never factually know when this occurred. I personally don't believe that Hager had a full two and a half story house, but did have the one and a half stories. We do believe that the elevation to the house was done sometime prior to 1800. My own opinion is that the second Jacob Roar put the elevation on uh, because he starts having quite a number of children in the 1770s and I think he just needed the additional space. Uh, other than that, that's the only really structural change to this house. This house has retained its integrity. The walls are all in the same place. Uh, the only thing that people have done over the years is what I will call cosmetic changes where they had to put on the new roof, and new windows, and new trim, new floorboards, those kinds of things. Today, the house stands as a memorial to Jonathan Heger and the German heritage he brought to Hagerstown. It holds many memories, not only from Jonathan and Elizabeth Heger's life, but also many other families throughout its 200-year history serving as a residence. Michael Hammond is, um, he was one of the owners of the house. He had many children that died here. And a lot of various people that walk through the parks uh, have spotted him on the porch sitting on the bench in his black uh, top hat and black coat, looking set mourning over the loss of his uh, children. Is it possible that these memories are so clear and so vivid that they've remained in the house over the centuries? As a historian, I like to think that I'm trained to look at things objectively and with a little bit of skepticism. And that being said, there are some things that have happened in this particular house that really have no explanation. And although you look for answers, in many ways you can't find them. What has happened to me over the years are, are, are little things, but it certainly makes you wonder. Uh, pieces in this house have been known to move. Bulls move on table. Uh, we'll be giving a tour early in the morning, give the second tour a little bit later that morning, and the bull is now in a different place. There is a baby's rocking chair in the master bedroom that has been known to spin around, in fact, during the day. It'll be in different angles. The Jonathan Hager House is open from April until December for tours to the public, but most of the tours come during the summer months. It was during one of these summers the two tour guides experienced a rocking chair that just wouldn't stay still. We had two uh, young tour guides this summer, uh, uh, that, that particular summer, and I think this was the summer of 1997, and the one girl came in, gave her normal tour. This is the master bedroom. It's the only room with a fireplace. The second girl came in right after that tour. She had some other people, so uh, we had back-to-back -back tours on that particular day. Now, when she got to the master bedroom, she noticed that this baby's rocking chair was now facing 180 degrees the other direction. This is the master bedroom. It's the only bedroom with a fireplace, so she had a bedroom that got any heat during the winter. A girl, Jessica, and I were working here, and she gave a tour, and she said that the chair was moved around facing the opposite direction of the fireplace. When she was done with her tour, she came down and said to the other girl, did you move the rocking chair in the master bedroom? And she said no. She goes, well, it was turned completely around the other way. Well, about the time they finished that conversation, still another tour came for the day, and the first girl had to present that tour. So she's going through the house, and she goes upstairs to the master bedroom, and now this rocking chair was back at the angle in the first place. This is the master bedroom. It's the only room in the fireplace. So this is a chair that for some reason has spun completely around during the day. You might look at this story and say, well, perhaps when they weren't looking, a, a tourist moved the chair. And that could be true. And maybe that's the explanation for some of the things that move. But the girls are, and anyone who works here, are trained to make sure that tourists do not touch any of the pieces. And they are supposed to stay with them completely through the tour. So I don't think that a tourist touched that chair that particular day. When we give tours, uh, you are locked in the house with the tour guide. The tour guide will lock the front door so that there are only the people on the tour and the guide themselves are in the house. There is nobody else in the house. Nobody else has the keys except the tour guide. When there are no tours in the house, the door is locked, the keys are kept in the office. So there's absolutely no way that anybody can enter the house and, and move some things without us knowing it. Who or what could be moving the items around the Hager house? Could it be malevolent spirits or just prankster tourists? We also have a corncob doll on this particular rocking chair and it has moved from side to side during the chair during the day. It used to sit in the rocker which was in the girls room and then we moved the rocker into the master bedroom and ever when we moved it the corn cup doll would move from room, it would move up on the chest in the girls room, it would be on the girls room in the bed, it would just move all over the upstairs without us touching it. There's a hatchel, it's a piece of equipment that you use to clean out uh, dirt and seeds from uh, flax which you use to make linen and about two years ago it started, there were 
flax would be in the hatchel and we'd move it out. And every time we'd go in, it'd be back in the hatchel. So we think maybe there's like a spinster ghost or something and it keeps putting it back in the hatchel. It's not just mysteriously moving objects that go on at the Hager house. There have been other things that are, are a little bit more interesting, uh, and they actually involve voices. On one particular occasion, when I was closing up the Hager house at the end of the day, I went to get the keys and the lock, went to the door, uh, the front door of the house to, to lock the house up for the evening. And John? And it was so real, the first thing I said was, huh? And I looked behind me, and then of course I realized, Wait a second, there is no one else in this house. There have been several Johns who have lived here in this Hager house throughout its existence, so maybe that is somebody calling one of those others. I, I don't know. That was very startling. Uh, so I don't know. Sounds do carry in City Park, so maybe it could be a sound that, that came over from a, an adjoining neighborhood. I guess I'll never know. That's not the first time I've heard voices, though. On one particular morning, I came to the Hager house first thing. From behind me, I heard an elderly woman's voice say, Hello? Now I thought, well, it's the first visitor of the day, and I looked around the house, but there was nobody here yet. On, on one particular occasion, I put the key in the front door at the beginning of the day, and I distinctly heard someone run out the steps, and it was six steps, it was bump, 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 and that's when it ended. And my first reaction was there was somebody in the house, but then it occurred to me, well, the alarm system would have picked up anybody in the house, and so I, of course, wondered what was going on inside the house, and I did search all around, there was nobody in the house. During craft days three years ago, I was giving um, a tour in the upper hallway. A lady in green passed by me. I thought it might have been one of the other workers. So when you put the larger drawer back in, wouldn't you see the smaller box? But they disappeared. One place at the Hager House that has had some of the most interesting incidents doesn't involve moving objects or strange sounds at all. The basement must hold many memories for the families living in the house. This evidence might be seen in some of the strange occurrences witnessed in the basement by visitors, employees, and even our video crew. Last year, we were giving the ghost tours. We were all down in the basement, and um, one of the tour tours commented that there was a smell of cherry pies, like someone was baking, and we all started to smell it. One of the most interesting events occurred while our own production crew was videotaping a program for the Hager House. And while shooting a segment for the basement, the crew noticed audio problems that could not be explained. The audio problems caused the production to be halted for the day, and eventually the audio mixer had to be sent out for repairs. Upon being asked what the problem was with the mixer, the repair facility could offer no explanation. On a much darker note, some of the most disturbing occurrences reported in the basement deal with the feelings of death and distress emanating from a certain corner. Um, the corner of the basement, that's, no one likes to go in there, everyone thinks it's really creepy and someone might have got killed in there. We have psychics that say that someone was murdered in that corner. And it's really spooky. <laughs> I, I think the more interesting thing about the house is virtually everybody who has ever been employed here during my, my tenure at the Hager House are pretty much scared to go down in the cellar by themselves. And I don't know why. They just get a creepy feeling and they don't like it down there. The producers of this program walked through the house with a psychic who described the images they got from the basement as those being associated with the death of either an animal or human. The images were described as all having large amounts of blood associated with them. John has said that he's heard someone yelling from the basement in that corner, someone calling his name, um, different noises coming from the basement area. And no, no one else I to work with likes the basement. No one's ever liked it. I've even had one former tour guide say a scream came from the cellar of the house one day. Again, noises carry in City Park. Maybe that noise came from somewhere else. Jonathan Hager built the house over two springs. Both springs are located in the basement of the house where a large stone fireplace sits. It is believed that most of the cooking was done down in the basement year-round. Also located in the basement is a large double door that leads outside. This door is large enough to have brought in livestock for butchering. Are the images that our psychic saw associated with butchering livestock for a weekly meal? Or could it be something more sinister? We'll never know. And the spirits in the house just aren't talking. Jonathan Hager died on November the 5th, 1776, 
from wounds he received while helping to construct the Zion Reformed Church, which sits on top of the hill on North Potomac Street. There are actually two different accounts of how Jonathan Hager died. Both stories agree on what killed him. A huge log fell on him and crushed him. But the location of the accident is what is different. The first says he was actually killed at the church while he was helping with the construction. The other version of the story say that he was killed at a sawmill along the Antietam Creek when a log rolled on him and crushed him. No matter where the accident occurred, Jonathan Hager and his family finally ended up here at Zion Reformed Church. Could it be that his final resting place isn't there, but here at his home in today's city park? I don't think it's the the Hagers. I think it might be the Hammond family or the Roars. Probably the Hammonds. He had a lot of children that died in the house, and um, most of the stuff that happens would be things that kids would do, like moving the corn cob doll and stuff like that. Whether or not someone believes in these particular episodes or not, that's up to them personally. I think it's very interesting that virtually in all religions there's some discussion of afterlife. Yet when you, when you bring it up, you see something that looks like it might be evidence. And people seem to go a little bit nuts about it. I don't know if these things actually happen. I think there's various energies that will always stay around. I mean, energy is never, I guess, like matter, created or destroyed. I think things just happen. Uh, I don't look at reasons why they're happening. I think most of the things at the Hager House are what I call passages in time incidents where somebody ran up the steps once upon a time, it just happened again. The energy is, is just always there. I think they're important, again, to, uh, to cut through the story and try to find the truth behind it because let's say someone did run up the steps. Maybe we can find out exactly why he ran up the steps. Maybe there was someone upstairs who was in trouble and he ran up to help that person. We don't know. Again, you have to spend a lot of time cutting through everything else and then maybe you can make a determination as to exactly what happened. The next time you visit downtown Hagerstown, take notice of some of the older buildings around you. What kind of stories do they have to tell? What events took place inside these buildings long ago? You'll find the answers to some of these questions every October when the city hosts guided ghost tours throughout the downtown area. These walking tours take visitors on a tour of downtown Hagerstown and tell the history associated with some of the older buildings. These tours have grown more popular every year. And next, we'll bring you some of our visitors' favorites in our Ghosts of Hagerstown segment. Hagerstown began as a frontier town laid out in September 1762 by Jonathan Hager on a tract of land he called New Work. Hager laid out 520 lots of one half acre each among seven streets. These streets today are known as Walnut, Jonathan, Potomac, Church, Franklin, Washington, and Antietam. Despite the date of 1762 as the official founding date, there is much disagreement over when the city was actually founded. Some historians believe it wasn't founded until 1765 when the first parcels of land were sold. Hager, more than anything else in his life, uh, would be a land speculator. From the time he sells this house in 1745, he continues to buy land at a low price and sell off tracts and chunks of it at a profit. Uh, it's argued exactly when Hagerstown is laid out, and the best evidence is either 1762, which is the accepted date, or 1765. Whatever the year he decided to lay out the town, he certainly profited because he laid out 520 lots. Each lot consisted of about a half an acre each, so he was selling each individual lot. And that's where Hager would have made an awful lot of his money. And it does appear that the ha uh, town itself, Hagerstown, which originally was called Elizabethtown, after his wife Elizabeth, was basically put together as a center for trade use. Uh, it looks like he wanted to encourage traders to come into this area and put their warehouses in his brand new town. However, the name Elizabethtown never caught on with the townspeople. They instead adopted the name Hager's Town. Because the townspeople were using both names and the confusion it was causing, the city council voted to officially change the name to Hagerstown on December 5, 1814. Nestled within the farmland that surrounded it, Hagerstown led a quiet life throughout its early history. However, during the Civil War, Hagerstown saw excitement several times as both Union and Confederate armies occupied the town. But it was in the few years preceding the Civil War that Hagerstown would see one of its most infamous visitors. In the 1800s, on the site of the building we know today as the Baldwin House, stood the magnificent Washington House Hotel. 
In late 1859, on a sweltering summer evening, a mysterious tall man checked into the hotel with his two sons and an associate. The four men deliberately and quietly went straight to their rooms on the second floor, speaking to no one. But as history would tell, the names registered in the hotel's ledger weren't the men's real names. We have the ledger book uh, at the Western Maryland room, which has the signature. He signed it uh, Isaac Smith because he didn't want his uh, actual name to be known. But his two sons signed in. They listed themselves as residents of New York, which was false. During that hot summer night, another hotel guest on the second floor became ill. I've called for the doctor. He'll be here soon. Oh, thank you for coming. Well, how long has he been like this? A couple of hours. Let me look at him. I think he has a serious case of consumption. The man screaming awoke the other guests who began to fill into the hallway to investigate the awful noise. One of the people who came out of their rooms was a young woman carrying a baby in her arms. At the same time, the tall man also came from his room to see what the commotion was all about. When the young woman with the child saw the mysterious tall man enter the hallway, she seemed to go mad. No, no, don't hurt me. Don't take my baby. Years later, history would reveal that the young woman wasn't mad at all, but in fact was telling the truth. She had previously been living in a small town in Kansas and was traveling eastward to start a new life with her baby. When she saw the mysterious man in the Washington House Hotel, she immediately recognized him. The man who registered that June evening was none other than the infamous abolitionist John Brown, who had raided all the slave-owning households in Kansas, including hers, killing her husband and burning their home. Seeing Brown so far away from her Kansas home was a shock from which the woman had never fully recovered. After the event, John Brown and his sons traveled to the southern part of Washington County, to the Kennedy Farm, which was a staging point for Brown's famous raid on Harper's Ferry just a short time later. It is said today in the Baldwin House, on hot June evenings, if you walk slowly down one of the second floor hallways, you may hear the eerie, distant screaming of a young woman begging for the life of her child. No! Don't hurt me! Don't hurt me! Several years later, in the summer of 1863, the streets of Hagerstown erupted with the sounds of the Civil War. It was during that summer that one of the largest and deadliest battles of the Civil War took place just north of the Mason-Dixon line. On July 1st, 2nd, and 3rd, 1863, the farm fields around Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, were witness to the horrors of the Civil War. The battle ended in the failed charge, now known as Pickett's Charge, and the terrible loss of thousands of men. And following Pickett's failed charge on the third day, Robert E. Lee decided to pull his army from the battlefield and uh, retreat back to the safe ground of Virginia. His route that he selected would have brought him out of Gettysburg to Fairfield, roughly down through Waynesboro and uh, Greencastle, through Hagerstown to Williamsport, and then crossing the Potomac at Williamsport back to Virginia. In his withdrawal, General Lee sent the wounded first in a 17-mile wagon train with Jeb Stewart's cavalry in support. However, when Stewart and the wounded arrived in Williamsport, they found the Potomac River overflowing from the summer storms that had followed the battle. Lee's plans had to change. The cavalry under Stewart was directed to protect the east of the Confederate Army. They came down through Smithsburg, Hagerstown. Well, prior to their arrival, the Federals arrived here in Washington County at Boonesboro. After an engagement in Smithsburg on July the 5th, Confederate General Jeb Stewart decided to send two regiments of his cavalry into Hagerstown on Monday, July the 6th. But Stewart's men soon discovered the Federal Army had sent their own men into the city of Hagerstown. These mounted Union regiments were under the command of Brigadier General Judson Kilpatrick. So at noon on Monday the 6th, the uh, fighting began in the streets of Hagerstown. Kilpatrick's men coming in, 
Kilpatrick uh, had with him uh, two divisions. One of those was uh, Custer's, Michigan's. He also had a West Virginia uh, division with him, and most of these were engaged in downtown Hagerstown. Roughly, the fighting which existed between around noon and dark in Hagerstown extended between what is roughly now the library on South Potomac Street up to Zion Reformed Church on North Potomac Street and in the side streets around there. And there was a lot of fighting in and around the square. And the Federals pushed the Confederates up the hill towards Zion. The Confederates took positions behind the tombstones and the stone wall at Zion Reformed Church. The fighting moved up and down Potomac Street several times that afternoon. Then as the afternoon wore on, First West Virginia came into the square, along with the 18th Pennsylvania, and they formed for one big charge up the hill. Now, what they didn't know was the first foot soldiers from Gettysburg had arrived in town. See, the cavalry got there a number of hours. They could ride, where these other guys had to walk. Got here, and there was a, a regiment that formed up around Zion before church. And when the cavalry charged up the hill, the Confederates greeted them with one massive volley that just decimated the group, drove them back down to the square. The evening wore on. At about dusk, uh, Kilpatrick decided to pull out of Hagerstown because he had suffered a lot of losses, and the Confederates maintained control of Hagerstown. Lee and his forces were finally able to withdraw to the Virginia side of the Potomac River on the evening of the 12th and the morning of the 13th. But it wasn't until Lee had fought several other skirmishes besides Hagerstown. The engagement at Hagerstown was the only fighting in the county that recorded any civilian casualties, which brings us to the second segment in our Ghosts of Hagerstown series. At the outbreak of the fighting downtown, a young artist named John Stemple decided he would venture to the square to sketch the fighting. He thought that if he'd be able to capture the images of the battle, he might be able to earn a bit of extra money by selling his artwork to a major newspaper. The studios were about one block west of the square, about where the banks are right now. He went down, climbed up on the roof of the building that was occupied by Marshall and Cranwell. It was a hardware store. The Marshall and Cranwell hardware store occupied the northeast corner of Public Square, the current location of the clock tower. Stemple climbed up to the roof of Marshall and Cranwell's to capture the battle scene below in the square. Shortly after he had set up his tripod and easel, a stray bullet punctured his skull. Two men and a woman who were taking refuge down in the hardware store immediately ran up to care for the artist who was bleeding profusely. They carried him to the floor below where a doctor was called for. But because all the doctors were already preoccupied with soldiers from the battle, they had no choice but to take him across the square to the home of a woman who practiced medicine. Easy, easy. Stemple was carried to the home and cared for by the woman. But despite all of her efforts, she could do nothing for the doomed artist. Will he be okay? I don't think so. But despite the woman's efforts, she could not stop the bleeding. Stemple finally died in less than an hour after the bullet pierced his head. John Stemple's body rests in Rose Hill Cemetery on South Potomac Street. His presence can often be felt late at night where the store once stood and the artist met his end. Some even say they've heard an agonizing scream of pain. Some even say that Stemple can be seen on the anniversary of the battle in one of the windows of the clock tower, roughly where the rooftop of Marshall and Cramwell's store once reached. Another story tells not of a human spirit, but of a faithful horse. This legend takes place on the site of what is now the Potomac Street parking deck.
But in 1863, the Franklin Hotel stood in its place. Not too long after the Battle of Hagerstown, the Federal Army was able to dislodge the Confederates from the streets of the town. On July the 12th, Union General George Armstrong Custer's Michigan regiments cleared the town and returned it to federal control. Custer's men took several casualties in the fight, and those who were wounded were left to recover as the Federal Army marched back toward Washington. One of Custer's men who was wounded in the battle was Captain Pennybacker. He had received several deep saber wounds to his body, keeping him from leaving with the rest of the Union Army. Pennybacker's horse was an old, faithful stallion named Monarch that was stabled in the rear of the hotel and cared for by one of the grateful citizens of Hagerstown. Every day, Captain Pennybacker would call for his horse and have him brought to the front of the hotel where he could see and talk to his faithful companion. Thank you, sir. Pennybacker eventually died from his wounds, and the horse was given to the young man who had cared for it. Over the following years, Monarch would break away from his new master's stable and return to the hotel, awaiting the kind words of his master. Words that never came. It's been reported on dark nights when no moon is visible, you can hear Pennybacker's faithful horse trotting to the front of the building. Sometimes, it's believed that you can even hear the captain's lonely calls in a desperate effort to make contact with his valiant steed. The city of Hagerstown has had a long, rich history. Even today, you can see some of the lasting results of the fighting in downtown. On the building that houses Psalms Jewelers, you can still see some of the bullet marks on the second and third floors. The stories we have visited are just a few of the stops along the Ghosts of Hagerstown walking tour. You can find out more about some of the other buildings and stories every October when the city of Hagerstown hosts the walking tours. Over the decades, Hagerstown has changed. Residents and visitors have come and gone. Buildings have done the same. But one thing that has remained is the history and legends that belong to the city of Hagerstown. From the central part of Washington County, we bring you here to the eastern part. This is South Mountain. South Mountain has always played an important role in this area. Its gaps and passes were natural passageways west for the early settlers. It provided natural defense from Indian attack. But most importantly, it was the site of the first battle between Robert E. Lee's Army of Northern Virginia and George B. McClellan's Army of the Potomac in the Civil War. What's become known as the Battle of South Mountain is our focus in the next series of legends. This battle played an important role in Lee's first invasion into northern soil but it became overshadowed by the events that took place just a few days later, the Battle of Antietam. It was only just recently that this South Mountain area became recognized as an official battlefield site. The uh, South Mountain State Battlefield was created uh, two years ago in June of 2000, uh, enacted by a bill signed by Governor Glenn Denning that created the battlefield. Uh, it is the first state-operated battlefield in the state of Maryland. All the other battlefield sites are oper operated by the National Park Service. So uh, we're pretty fortunate in the fact that uh, we have finally were able to get this uh, proclaimed as an official Civil War battlefield. In this final segment, we'll bring you an update on a legend we brought you in our last Legends program. And we'll take you to one of the oldest sites in Washington County. But first, we will take you to the little Frederick County town of Burkittsville. This quiet little community lies just at the base of the southern portion of South Mountain, below a break in the volcanic folds called Crampton's Gap. We travel back to September 1862, when the Civil War, for the first time, brought its horrors to northern soil. Early that month, Confederate General Robert E. Lee began to move his army northward into Maryland. Lee moved the Confederate Army of Northern Virginia to Leesburg, where he gathered the various elements of his army, and then will begin to cross at uh, White's Ford, 
which is on the Potomac River and not far away from White's Ferry. They're two separate places. Uh, just to the east of Leesburg and crossing over into Maryland, they will come up to Poolsville and by various routes arrive in Frederick. All of Lee's army will be crossed the Potomac River and into Frederick by the 7th of September. Lee felt that a victory on northern soil might help France and England to recognize the South as an independent state. He had also hoped that by moving into the virgin fields of Maryland, it might help relieve Virginia of supplying the Confederate Army with food. He has very high hopes for this campaign, that this could be the winning campaign for the Confederate States of America. Several days after Lee crossed into Maryland, McClellan began to cautiously pursue him by moving northward from Washington. McClellan and the Army of the Potomac reached Frederick on September 13th. McClellan learned that Lee had moved out of the area just days before. Unfortunately, Lee's next move was unknown to McClellan. But while staying in Frederick, McClellan's luck changed when a Union soldier found written orders from Lee to the rest of the Army wrapped around a cigar. Part of Lee's plans assumed that once he moved into Maryland, a Union army would be forced to come out of Washington, D.C. and pursue him, that the Union government could not afford to let him wander at will through Western Maryland, which was quite correct. Special Order 191 detailed Lee's Maryland campaign. It laid out his plans to split the Army of Northern Virginia into five parts. Three parts were to march toward Harper's Ferry to put pressure on the Union garrison there, one part to travel to Hagerstown, and the last part under the command of General D.H. Hill, was ordered to stay behind at Boonesboro to guard the Army's rear. On September 14th, McClellan moved out of Frederick in pursuit of Lee. He moved his army toward the gaps of South Mountain. Early on the morning of the 14th, the Union Army found the Confederates spread along the Frederick County side of South Mountain, from Turner's Gap, where the old South Mountain Inn stands, southward to Fox's Gap, where we will hear about the old farmer, Daniel Wise finally ending at Crampton's Gap, which becomes the basis for our first legend of South Mountain, the legend of Spook Hill. The battle at Crampton's Gap was meant to be the main focus of McClellan's advance on the 14th of September. He had given very positive and very uh, uh, precise orders to General Franklin, commanding the 6th Union Army Corps, to advance from his position in Jefferson, or beyond Jefferson, to take possession of Crampton's Gap, and once through the Gap, to vigorously uh, go through Pleasant Valley and rescue that Harper's Ferry garrison of 12,000 or more federal soldiers. Uh, this was to be the end run. And uh, almost from the beginning, Franklin does not move near as vigorously as McClellan had uh, encouraged or anticipated him to do. When the uh, Federal Sixth Corps arrived in Burkittsville, they got there about noon and were met by artillery fire on the uh, top of the mountain. Uh, they, they dropped back, uh, ate lunch, and took about four hours to develop an actual scheme of attack. When the attack came, it came again around about 4, 4.30 in the afternoon. As the Union 6th Corps approached Burkittsville. Uh, the Confederate guns will begin to fire at long range, uh, seeing this approach coming and realizing that they can slow down an attack. And uh, Franklin will order up some of his artillery to deploy and fire back, and so there is a, a substantial artillery barrage that is going to accompany this infantry assault. The uh, initial artillery position early in the morning was further down around the turn. This was part of uh, Chew's battery and then the Portsmouth Light Artillery also joined them there on that particular area. Uh, as the fighting started and it looked like the Confederate line was going to be overwhelmed, Chew and the other guns pulled out of the area. Uh, again, it wasn't until Cobb arrived with his regiment that the Troop Light Artillery, who was attached to them, came into the gap itself. And basically, they had one gun pointing down each road uh, as the Federals popped up over the hill. And they were only able to get off about five rounds, but even at that, they did so very well. And that fact wasn't missed by one of the federal officers who commended them for their bravery. Once they see that a Union attack is forming, they will send word to McClaws that they are about to be attacked and asking for reinforcements. McClaws will respond by sending a brigade of Georgians, commanded by a general by the name of uh, Cobb, to Crampton's Gap to reinforce the uh, pitifully small defenders, the uh, 
Virginia regiments under Parham and, and Munford's uh, two regiments of, of Confederate cavalry. Uh, but Cobb's Georgians will arrive practically simultaneously with the Union assault. Federal Sixth Corps, of course, at that time had about 12,000 men in it. Uh, unbeknownst to them, though, behind a stone wall along what's called Mountain Church Road today was only about 1,000 Confederate soldiers. When the Union soldiers close in on the Confederates along the stone wall at Mountain Church Road, the order of charge is given. As this Federal advance begins, as the charge is made and the Virginians at the wall begin to give way, uh, there will be an attempt to get the artillery pieces out of there, that they will bring up their horse teams, attach their cannons to the limbers, which the horses pull, and of course retreat back over the hill. But they will try to make a fighting retreat of it, pausing a couple of times to fire. Uh, some of Cobb's uh, artillery guns will be captured. He had brought up a battery with him, and uh, that uh, battery will lose two guns in this fight. So once the Federals' push uh, started in earnest, the, the, the story was foretold. Uh, sheer weight of numbers again drove the Confederates from behind the stone wall and pushed them up through the gap. And so the Federals will be driving up uh, the two roads that intersect at the top of Crampton's Gap at where the correspondence arch is now and in between the two and driving back the Confederate defenders as they uh, uh, do so. And of course it is simply a matter of numbers and... Uh, uh, the Confederates would be forced to yield with severe losses. Confederates tried one last stand in the pass itself again along another stone wall. Two guns of the troop light artillery were brought up and fired canister right into the faces of the Federal soldiers as they were popping up over the ridge. Uh, this staggered the Federals for a moment, but again, sheer weight of numbers told the tale and they were quickly overwhelmed and were forced to draw off the top of the mountain down into the uh, valley beyond. Franklin's troops, too exhausted to pursue, come up the road and spend the night in the Gap and along these mountain roads. It is the Confederate withdrawal up and into Crampton's Gap that serves as the basis for our first South Mountain legend. The legend of Spook Hill tells the story of the Confederate artillerymen who valiantly tried to save their guns during the Union charge up the mountainside. As the Union soldiers charged towards them, the Confederate soldiers manning the guns tried desperately to push their cannons up the side of the mountain but as the Confederates pushed the guns upward, they were either shot or had to abandon the guns to save their own lives. This caused the cannons to roll back down the hill, killing the other Confederate soldiers who were also fleeing for their lives below. It is believed by local residents that these poor Confederate souls never left the battlefield that day. Today, the area is quiet. The sounds of cannons aren't even a memory anymore. The entire area shows virtually no signs of the Battle of South Mountain, except for an occasional sign along the road. But there is one spot along the Gapland Road that may still hold the memories of the actions that took place that afternoon. It is said that if you stop your car at a certain spot along Gapland Road next to the battlefield, place it in neutral, you'll begin to drift uphill. People speculate that it's those Confederate soldiers that are pushing vehicles back up the mountain. They are forever charged with the task of pushing the cannons back up the mountain to Crampton's Gap and away from the advancing Federals. Some say the legend isn't true, that the portion of Gaplin Road is just an optical illusion. They claim that the road in fact slopes downwards, not upwards. It's just a simple trick of optics but some tell an entirely different legend altogether. The legend that I know of surrounding Burkittsville uh, was that uh, after the battle, a wagon load of wounded, evidently without horse teams attached, was left on a piece of the road which looked evidently to be level or slightly tilted in one direction, but in fact it was an optical illusion sort of thing. We're actually tilted in the other, and so when they unhitched the teams and just left the wagon sitting, it moved in a direction that appeared to many people to be rolling uphill, and that this was a phenomena that uh, many people took as some sort of uh, uh, sign. And so the legend was that uh, in modern times people would drive their automobiles to this spot and take them out of gear and, and release emergency brake and the car would likewise appear to roll uphill and people began to make some sort of uh, conclusion that this had something to do with the spiritual world and not uh, physics. 
The, uh, the legend as I heard it was that uh, prior to the Battle of South Mountain, or just as the battle was beginning, a uh, Confederate artillery group was trying to push one of their artillery pieces up the road towards the mountain to get it up on top ready for, uh, for action. When a Federal artillery shell landed on the crew, killing them all instantly. Uh, the legend then is that even to today, that same group of men are trying to push that cannon to the top of the mountain, which is why you can take your car down there, put it in neutral, and it starts to roll backwards up the mountain. Is it simple physics? Does the road actually slope downhill? Maybe. Then again, yet maybe something else entirely different is happening along that stretch of Gaplin Road. In our last Legends program, we brought you the story of an old farmer who lived here at Fox's Gap by the name of Daniel Wise. As the legend goes, Old Man Wise was contracted by the Union Army to help bury the dead on his land after the Battle of South Mountain. The fighting at Fox's Gap was some of the fiercest of all the fighting that September day, and it lasted the longest. The combat at Fox's Gap started around 9 in the morning and lasted until well after dark. The combat started uh, between 3,000 Ohio troops under the command of General Jacob D. Cox and 1,000 North Carolinians under the command of Brigadier General Samuel Garland. Around about 10.30 in the morning, uh, Samuel Garland, the Confederate uh, general, was uh, mortally wounded on the field. At that point, of course, Confederate resistance started to dissolve and the Federals were able to push the Confederates through the gap and actually controlled the gap by around noon. They held their ground for almost two hours. Uh, and it was uh, one of the few instances in the war where there was actually hand-to-hand -hand combat. It, it, it got that fierce. Usually in the Civil War, when the, the two armies would come together, the, the sheer terror of, of the firepower, you know, the, the charges would just peter out before there was physical contact. But there was about a 15 to 20 minute period around mid-morning when it actually got to club muskets and, and bayonet wounds. It was during the fierce morning fighting that Confederate General Samuel Garland was mortally wounded and taken to the old South Mountain Inn, or as it was known then, the Mountain House. Eventually, the North Carolinians, for the most part, were driven down the west face of the mountain, and uh, Cox's Ohioans ha had actually won the crest. But now the, the Union Army was suffering under the misconception that the Confederates were a much larger force and there was a Johnny behind every tree. These tactics were enough to stall the Union Army to wait until reinforcements arrived to renew the fighting. What these rebels did, they called bushwhacking. They would hide behind a fence, jump up and shoot, duck down, run to another place, jump up and shoot, and they were all over Fox's Gap and it gave General Cox the impression that there was a much larger force. And so he decided that discretion was the better part of valor and he would wait for reinforcements. He pulled back, Anderson's men uh, continued their bushwhacking and, and sort of a law sets in around midday. Now, as the day progresses, more Union troops start showing up from the direction of Frederick. And we're talking about the Union 9th Corps under the overall command of General Ambrose Burnside. The Corps commander is General Jesse Lee Reno. Troops of the 9th Corps start showing up and start supporting Cox's position, getting ready for a general advance around 4 or 5 in the afternoon. On the Confederate side, uh, Longstreet's troops start arriving from Hagerstown. There's a bit of an irony with the Battle of South Mountain. Uh, many of the Union soldiers started their march some 12 miles to the east in Frederick, while many of the Confederates started their march that morning some 11 miles to the west from Hagerstown and they both meet on the mountain. The area around Wise's cabin was hotly contested. Uh, this part of the battlefield was fought over the entire day and uh, square foot for square foot, the fighting was just as intense here as you find on any other Civil War battlefield. Antietam, Gettysburg, it doesn't matter. Soldiers long after the war talked about how hot and intense the fighting was in this part of the field. Uh, the Wise's cabin became a feature. Uh, it was well defined, it was easy to see, so a lot of the troops referred to it in their after action reports and in their diaries and things like that. So the, uh, the, the fighting swirled around Wise's cabin throughout the entire day. As the Confederates tried to launch their counterattack, they used what was called the Sharpsburg Road at that time as a line to form up in. They started to move across Wise's south field, 
uh, towards the Federals that were lined up along a stone line, a stone wall against the, uh, the south end of that field. Unbeknownst to them, of course, this was the remainder of the IX Corps that had managed to get, it up, get itself up on top of the mountain before they launched their attack. In the rush to get their men on the field, some Confederate troops wound up getting lost on the west face of the mountain. These lost troops were supposed to have been part of a larger contingent of Confederate troops that were supposed to be a grand movement that was to sweep the Federals from the mountain. As a result, only one regiment of troops from the Plan 3 entered the field of battle and ended up taking heavy casualties. One new regiment, the 17th Michigan, about 900 green troops fresh out uh, of Michigan, uh, less than two weeks, managed to get in a field behind Drayton's troops, come up behind them, and fire down into what is now the Reno Monument Road. Drayton's men take horrific casualties. One regiment uh, went in with 250 men and came out with 120. More than 50% casualties. And some of the bodies in the well, uh, in Wise's well at South Mountain, probably were Drayton's men. And you hear the exact same comments about that part of the road as you hear about Bloody Lane. Men's bodies stacked like cordwood. Uh, you could walk from one end of the road to the other without once touching the ground because of the large number of bodies that were stacked in there. Uh, because of that, of course, the 50 or 51st Georgia had to get out of the, the way they could. They had to run the gauntlet down the road and off the uh, west side of the mountain, uh, ending the fighting in that part of the field. So what exactly is the legend of Wise's Well? Here, in its entirety, is the 1992 presentation of the legend of Wise's Well. This is the monument that marks the spot where General Reno was killed during the Battle of South Mountain. The Battle of South Mountain was a bloody battle. Folks that had witnessed that said that it seemed like the side of the mountain ran red with blood. There were several generals killed during that battle. But after the battle was over, as darkness fell, the Confederates retreated under cover of darkness and marched over to Sharpsburg. Now the next morning when the sun came up and the Union generals looked over the battlefield, the Confederates were gone. They had retreated during the night. All they saw were the dead and dying just strewn all over the battlefield. Now as quickly as possible they took care of the wounded, but they didn't have time to bury the dead. But they realized if they left those bodies out there in the hot September sun, there might be a catastrophe. There might be an epidemic. So they decided that they would offer a dollar a body to all the local farmers to bury those dead Confederates. Now right here in this spot is Fox's Gap. This is where some of the worst fighting took place of the entire day. And just a stone's throw from here is the spot where old man Wise had his log cabin. Now that cabin was in horrible shape before the battle. But the morning after the battle, folks could not re believe that, that the cabin was still standing. It was so full of holes from cannons and shot and shell. Now that morning, as he strolled out and looked in his yard, he saw bodies everywhere. And he had heard about that offer of a dollar a body. And he looked out there and he thought, I'm going to make myself a heap of money. So old man Wise started out over the battlefield and started to drag those dead bodies, one by one, back to his house. And he had all these bodies laying there in his front yard. And he thought, boy, that's sure going to be an awful lot of digging to dig graves for all those dead rebels. And then he had an idea. Over there he had a well, and that well wasn't much good, it was a dry well. And he thought to himself, I'm going to take those dead bodies, and I'm going to bury them all right, but I'm going to bury them in my old well. And that's what he did. He took 58 dead rebel soldiers, and he shoved, and he stuck, and he forced all of those in that dry well. And then when he was finished, he threw in a lot of soil, and he covered them up.
Now, all the people around had heard about this, and they were up in arms. They said, those dead rebels, they were, they were our enemies, but that's sacrilege. You don't stuff them in a well. That's not the proper burial. But old man Wise, he was tickled with himself. He thought, well, I'm going to go down to Boonesboro, and I'm going to buy myself a new tobacco pipe and some tobacco. And that's what he did. He walked down to Boonesboro, got himself some supplies, and about two weeks later, in the evening, he was sitting on his front stoop on an old cracker box. And he was puffing away on that pipe, just enjoying himself, thinking, boy, I made myself a heap of money. And all of a sudden, he saw a movement down the road. are you? I've come to have you turn me over, Mr. Wise. Who are you? I'm most uncomfortable lying on my face. Turn me over. Please turn me over. Please turn me over. Turn me over. Turn me over. And he climbed in that well with his spade, and he started to dig. And he was digging as fast as he could. Finally, the 13th soldier, that was the one. Well, then he started to, to dig, and sure enough, that soldier was resting on his head. No wonder he was uncomfortable. He very carefully got that soldier out, and he reburied him. So he worked through the night soldier after soldier burying each one and finally as the sun streaked through the morning sky he had that last soldier buried and he got down on his knees and he said a little prayer he said please please don't haunt me anymore There's a pattern that emerges with the first-hand literature, the diaries and the letters. They, they note the dead Confederates. Uh, they note the Johnny on the wall. Some of them note that uh, the cabin up there at Fox's Gap, Wise's cabin, was used as a field hospital. There were tables set out front. There were amputations going on. But one thing that the first-hand accounts don't notice on September 15th is an old man dumping bodies down his well. Uh, there's no mention of that until September 16th. Now, by September 16th, most of the Union Army is off of the mountain. They're down in the Antietam area. The only Union soldiers left are those that are burying the dead. And I have a, a gentleman's diary who was on burial detail at Fox's Gap, and he gave uh, a number of 75 Union soldiers on burial detail, and it took them four days to bury the Confederate dead. They were still burying Confederate dead on September 18th, a day after Antietam. And uh, they finished up on the 18th and uh, went to join their units down at Antietam. Now, what happened on the 16th? There's one gentleman who wrote his memoir some years later, and he makes note of a Union burial detail, drunk on whiskey, dragging bodies to this well. And how it got started, one possibility might have been that some of the limbs from the field hospital had been dumped down the well to get rid of them, and the soldiers, you know, being uh, uh, under the influence of the alcohol, you know, sought the easy way out. And let's get something straight, too. Burial detail was not pleasant duty, I mean, even under the best of circumstances. And it always, it always surprised the men on burial detail how quickly the bodies would become offensive. And uh, in, in his memoirs, uh, Samuel Compton, the, the man who saw the, the detail, said the bodies had become so offensive that the only way the men could endure it was to be staggering drunk. So we have this first-hand account uh, on September 16th of bodies being dumped in a well. And uh, there were 58 bodies put in the well. According to the records uh, from the uh, reinterment that was done 12 years later, there were 58 bodies taken out of the well. 
How did the legend of Wise as Well get started? I think there's a, a couple of reasons. Um, I believe that the Wise family, and that would be Daniel Wise and his son and uh, daughter, were present uh, on the 15th and the 16th. Uh, I believe they couldn't get back into their house on the 15th because it was used as a field hospital. And I believe at least one family member was there on the 16th to watch the Union soldiers dumping the bodies down the well. And then uh, two or three weeks later, a gentleman from the Sanitary Commission, which was like the Red Cross, which followed the armies making sure they had proper medical supplies, uh, he noticed a hand sticking out of the ground. And he asked Daniel Wise about it. And uh, Wise told him that the Union boys started it, but I stopped them, and I contracted with General Burnside for a dollar a body to finish it. And I put 58 or 60 in that well, and I don't have my money yet, and what are you going to do about it? You know, it's my belief that Wise was trying to get some monetary uh, compensation for his ruined well. I don't think the well was abandoned. You know, Fifty years later, there's a story that says that the well was abandoned, when it's advantageous to the legend to have it abandoned, because if it was abandoned and they threw bodies in it, no harm was done. But I believe it was a working well, and the Union soldiers you know, put the bodies in it, and Wise wanted to get some money for his ruined well. There is no record that exists that ever suggests that Wise was paid a dollar a body or one cent a body or anything a body. We've been through the National Archives for uh, war claims and you know, uh, there's no $60 paid out to Daniel Wise. So I believe he was trying to get some money. Uh, he saw this gentleman from the Sanitary Commission, knew it was some kind of official organization and maybe he could get the money out of him. And this gentleman from the Sanitary Commission, he tells Charles Walcott about it, and Walcott puts it in his book, The History of the 21st Massachusetts, publishes that in 1882, and that's the first formal published account of Daniel Wise doing the deed. Now, I'm sure there was a local story. The man from the Sanitary Commission probably talked to the citizens of Boonesboro, and there is some evidence to suggest that Daniel Wise was a colorful character. He was uh, what was known as a root doctor, a practitioner of folk medicine. Um, so, you know, it probably would have made sense to the people in the area. All that crazy old man up on the mountain? Yeah, sure. Uh, it, it wouldn't surprise me that he put the bodies in the well. So there was probably a local story. Um, there was a gentleman who visited the site in 1865. Uh, Trowbridge was his name. And he confronted Wise with the story, and Wise denied it. You know, the Trowbridge words, he said he doesn't like to confess to it now. Well, of course not. He didn't do it. Um, so I believe he told the, the man from the Sanitary Commission that he did it to try and get some money. The other reason for the, the, the legend persisting these 130-odd years is that it, it's a neat little legend. I mean, here's this, this old eccentric man. He stops these soldiers from burying, you know, dumping bodies down his well. And he, he takes a general personally and, you know, confronts him and contracts with him and finishes it up. And then as the years went on, uh, ghosts came into the, to the story, and this gentleman in Middletown, this T.C. Harbaugh, uh, he wrote a story in 1909 called Turn Me Over, you know, where Wise is actually haunted by some soldier in the well who's face down, uncomfortable, and wants Wise to turn him over. It's a special, it's of note that uh, Mr. Har Harbaugh himself, in a letter uh, home in 1919, mentions that it was the 11th Ohio that, that dumped the bodies down the well, not a crazy old man. And to have this legend saves the reputation of the Union troops. It just wouldn't have been seemly to have stories of drunk Ohioans dumping bodies down a well in the post-war years. In the years after the Civil War, there's at least five presidents from the state of Ohio. So, you know, the, the legend helped save the reputation of the Union troops. So, was it true? Did Farmer Wise really drop bodies down an old well? Was he really visited by one of the soldiers who asked him to turn him over. This legend has lasted for over 100 years in our area, but since we brought you the story the last time, new information has come to light that may set the record straight. Here, once again, is Steve Stottlemyre. Since the last time that I talked about the legend of Wise as well, I have found a couple more letters and accounts by Union soldiers where they refer to burial details performing the act, and you know, not the crazy old farmer, Daniel Wise. But the most amazing thing, and, and for me the most wonderful thing, is that I actually found a descendant of Daniel Wise. But I should say that she found me. Uh, her name is Edna Dayton, and she lives in Tilmington, a few miles north of uh, Sharpsburg. And uh, her grandson married my niece, 
And one night, my niece was sitting around the kitchen table telling the family about her crazy uncle and this farmer who dumped bodies down the well, and, and the family about hit the ceiling. And so we made contact, and I got a wonderful story. Now, um, Edna's grandmother was named Anne Cecilia Shoemaker. And at the time of the battle, she was a five-year-old girl and was up at Fox's Gap. Now, Daniel had a son named John who was married. He had a spinster daughter named Matilda, and he had another daughter named Christiana. Um, Anne Cecilia was Christiana's daughter, and she loved to visit her Aunt Matilda. So she was up there that day. And the history that comes down, the family history that comes down, is through the eyes of a five-year-old girl. And uh, she told one story about a Confederate officer who had a ring and gave it to her, saying that she'd have no, he'd have no use for it after the day. Uh, another soldier said that uh, my brother is on the other side and I hope I don't meet him. The family were told early on that there was going to be fighting and that they should leave and they stayed uh, at a church at the bottom of the mountain and right at the bottom of the mountain is Mount Carmel Church. They buried their valuables in a trunk in the cellar and when they came back some time later uh, the trunk was still there and their valuables were still there but that was about all. Uh, there was a dead soldier in one of the beds once again, no record that the Wise family was ever recompensed for the ruined well. And of course, one aspect of the legend had that the well was empty, so no damage was done. Well, according to Edna and the family history, yes, the, the well was empty because it was under construction. Now, for me, you know, the most amazing thing is that uh, my niece had a son, and so my great-nephew is Daniel Wise's fifth great grandson, so I'm in there somehow. Uh, but it was very, it was very wonderful to actually meet a descendant of Daniel Wise and to discover the family history. So once again, um, there's no doubt in my mind that Daniel Wise didn't do the dirty deed. It was a drunken Union burial detail two days after the battle, and given the circumstances, uh, you know, I can't really blame him. Right now, uh, there's a group, uh, part of the Indiana University of Pennsylvania, headed up by archaeologist Joe Baer, that's doing some test digs in the area right around Fox's Gap. Uh, the plan is to hopefully be able to identify where Wise's cabin once stood, and then eventually come up with a management plan for that part of the battlefield. Uh, this is a cooperative effort. Uh, the state of Maryland is playing a part in it, but so is the Appalachian Trail, Central Maryland Heritage League. They, uh, they own property there, and they are the ones also that came up with a grant to uh, help uh, do this work. So there's several players that are, are part of this uh, project. Uh, and again, hopefully the two outcomes is to locate the cabin site and then uh, come up with a management plan. The story of Daniel Wise has been around for over a hundred years. It's been told thousands of times and even written about in books. Now, this story can finally be put to rest. While we can discount one story, there are plenty of others that still cannot be explained by conventional means. Coming up next, We'll head north to the old South Mountain Inn, where the legends begin long before the two armies of the Civil War stained the land red with blood. Our final legend takes place at the northernmost gap of South Mountain and the tales associated with the old stone inn that sits within that gap. Turner's Gap is the home of the old South Mountain Inn. Today, it's one of the area's finest restaurants. But during the Battle of South Mountain, it served as headquarters for Confederate General D.H. Hill. The fighting at Turner's Gap between Hill's division and federal troops under the command of General Ambrose Burnside never quite made it to the Mountain House. Instead, the fighting was concentrated to the northeast around Frost Town and eastward down the Frederick County side of South Mountain. Well, late in the day, uh, probably around about 4 o'clock in the afternoon, the Federal First Corps arrived in the field having traveled the distance from Frederick to uh, Turner's Gap along the National Road. Once they got here, they struck off north uh, towards the Frost Town uh, Road and the Frost Town Gap uh, further north. The idea was they were trying to perform what's called a double envelopment of the Confederate line, which is basically like trying to put them between two pinchers and squeezing the line together. Uh, First Corps traveled north, of course, up towards the uh, Frosttown Gap. When they got into that area, there was very few Confederates in front of them. In fact, there was only about uh, 1,200 Confederate soldiers of the 12th Alabama, commanded by uh, Robert Rhodes. Uh, as a 
the Federals started their attack up through that area then, again, there's very few Confederates, but they were able to use the terrain features, use the rocks, stone walls, and things like that to their uh, effectiveness and help to hold up the Federals as much as they could. Eventually, of course, just sheer weight of numbers, uh, Federals were able to finally gain the top of the mountain, caught the, uh, the Confederate left flank, and then started pushing them back towards Turner's Gap. It was about this time that Longstreet's command, the rest of his command, which had been in Hagerstown at the start of the battle, came all the way down to the mountain. They arrived at the mountain house and were immediately set out in front of the Federal attack. Uh, they were able to put up enough defense that the uh, Federals lost steam and darkness fell on the battlefield, ending the fighting for that part. By nightfall on September 14th, the Confederates still held the ground at Turner's Gap, but the losses on both sides were devastating. Later that night, the entire Confederate Army retreated down the west side of South Mountain into Sharpsburg. The next day, the Old South Mountain Inn, back then called the Mountain House, was turned into a hospital for the wounded on both sides. The Mountain House is one of the oldest structures in Washington County. Its history has been traced back to the 18th century. Over the years, historians have debated the actual date the Old Stone House was built, but all agree that the building in some form was constructed between 1700 and 1732. The Old South Mountain Inn was one of the first frontier dwellings that extended into the dangerous Indian Territory. Back then, Alternate Route 40 was just a mere pathway through the mountain gap that people would use to reach the frontier to trade with the Indians. It is believed by some that there was already an inn or trading post at this location when the area was first surveyed in 1730 by Arthur Nelson. Then in 1750, Robert Turner bought the land and named the Mountain Gap after himself. It is thought that Turner built the stone house we know of today as a home for his family. Building the stone house certainly wasn't an easy task. The shoulder of the mountain was dug out to make room for the house. The stone, which makes up the walls, was excavated by hand from the ridge and dragged by ox and sledge to the building site. All of the wood used in building the house was from trees felled on the mountainside. Some of the trees can even be seen in the cellar. They are the whole trunks laid as floor joists with the bark still on them. Around the turn of the century, Robert Turner sold the house to John Carey and Jacob Young. Historians have found evidence that shows Jacob Young was an innkeeper, so it is widely accepted that he and John Carey turned the mountain house into an inn for weary travelers who passed through Turner's Gap. By 1790, there was no question that the mountain house was a full-fledged inn, and by 1805, the road in front of the inn had grown from a small footpath to the National Road. The National Road connected Baltimore with the Mississippi River. Today, we know that stretch from Baltimore to Cumberland as alternate Route 40. With the construction of the National Road, the mountain house began to thrive. By 1810, the road was completed from Baltimore to Boonesboro and from Boonesboro to Hagerstown by 1820. It was not unusual for 18 to 20 coaches to pass the South Mountain Inn each day. But in 1862, the Civil War came to the doors of the Old South Mountain Inn. By nightfall on September 14th, approximately 4,000 men had become casualties of the fighting on the mountain that day. When the Federal Army took possession of the mountain house the next day, they found the house ransacked and abandoned except for the wounded that lay inside the house and on the surrounding grounds. The inn had been turned into a makeshift hospital, as many of the homes and barns were on that September day. The inn would see the wounded once again after the Battle of Antietam. The many ambulance wagons that passed the inn on their way to Baltimore and Washington would frequently stop for a drink of water from the well or a brief respite from the jostling of the road. The inn would change hands again shortly after the end of the Civil War. Then, in 1876, ownership of the inn was purchased by Madeline Dahlgren, who turned it into her private summer residence. Madame Dahlgren is best remembered by the stone chapel she had built across the street from the inn, as well as her novel entitled South Mountain Magic. In this book, Mrs. Dahlgren collected the accounts of superstitions and legends surrounding the area of South Mountain near the Mountain House. During her ownership of the Mountain House, Mrs. Dahlgren had several strange occurrences happen. One occurrence happened to two of Mrs. Dahlgren's prominent social guests who were staying at her house 
one Halloween night. Thank you once again for a lovely evening, Madeline. The dinner was superb as always. So delighted you liked it. Well, thank you. Don't you agree, Raymond? Yes, it was a wonderful evening. I'm so glad you could make it. Well, it's been, it's getting awfully late. I think we should turn in. Good night. Gentlemen, if you'll follow me, I'll show you to your room. Later that night, one of the men awoke to a strange smell. He got out of bed, went to the window, and noticed smoke emanating from the woods near the house. He quickly went and woke his friend and told him of the smell and smoke. Ray, Raymond, wake up. Do you smell something? Hey, what is it? I have no idea. It's throughout the entire house. I think it's coming from outside. Let's go get Thompson. Yes, that's an excellent idea. The man and his friend did what cultivated men do. They awoke one of Mrs. Dahlgren's hired hands. Thompson, wake up. Wake up, man. We need you to go outside. There's this horrible odor and, and a fog. Fog? Mountain fog? I don't know what kind of fog. Just get out of bed and go check. Very good, sir. Hurry up, man. Don't take all night. Yes, sir. Right, the top's in here. You might want to take this with you. Yes, sir. Hurry along, Thompson. Raymond, get the door for him. Now, go out there and see what you can see and report back to us. Now, let's go upstairs to the observatory and see what we can see from that view. The two gentlemen climbed to the top of the observatory, which sat in the eastern side of the house. The man investigated much of the property. Well, Thompson. Sirs, there is nothing out there. Good night. Nothing out there. We'll check it out for ourselves, won't we? Come along. Then, shortly after midnight, the two men witnessed something that would remain a legend to this day. Incredibly, the smoke took form, and before any of the gentlemen could react, the apparitions of two armies began to converge around the grounds of the inn. The two men recognized the uniforms of the two armies as those belonging to the Confederate States of America and the Federal Army. The sounds of the battle swelled and echoed through the mountain pass. The men knew they were witnessing a ghostly reenactment of the Battle of South Mountain right before them. The distinguished gentlemen quickly retreated and sought shelter in their beds. As quickly as they had appeared, the two armies and the pitched sounds of battle faded away, never to be seen or heard again to this day. Another occurrence happened while Mrs. Dahlgren and a friend were shopping in Frederick. She and her friend were dining in the ladies' lounge of the city hotel. Thank you so much for helping me pick this hat out, Lydia. I love it. It's so pretty. It'll look so nice in the springtime. Do you find it rather warm in here all of a sudden? No, not at all. Do you feel all right, Madeline? Yes. I just have a strange feeling there's something wrong at home. Do you mind riding at nighttime? Not at all, no. Well, Lydia, we must get home. When Mrs. Dahlgren walked into the house, she was greeted by her anxious family and servants. They told her a strange story that occurred after they had finished dining. The entire family had retired to a room which opened to the outside. Suddenly, they heard something enter through the front door and make its way into the dining room. The frightened witnesses heard the distinct clatter of hooves as the sound made its way from the dining room to the kitchen. It ascended the main staircase and finally faded away as it entered the attic. Mrs. Dahlgren wrote of several other stories in her book, South Mountain Magic. That book, in fact, is available in the Washington County Library. After Mrs. Dahlgren's tenure, 
the old mountain house was returned to service as an inn and passed through several owners through the early part of the 20th century. Today, the Old South Mountain Inn is proudly owned by Chad and Lisa Dorsey. Both of the Dorseys had worked at the inn for many years before purchasing it. I uh, started back here when I was 18, just out of school, needed a job, started here as a bus person. Um, did that for about a year. Uh, a lot of my friends were back in the kitchen working, was hanging out back there more than I should have been, uh, got in a little trouble and then uh, decided to get a job back in the kitchen. The chef asked me if I wanted to be a, a dishwasher for extra money, so did that. He saw how quick I worked, moved from dishwasher to basically prep cook, line cook. That's where I met Chad. And then kind of come up here to help him out a little bit on the holidays and on the weekends when he needed some help. And every other weekend became every weekend. And then it used to came during the week and, you know, it was more progressive. Every time he'd need help, he would call me and I'd come up and help him. Just started learning from the chef and he put me on the line and basically become, became his sous chef. And after that, um, things just came around that uh, they asked me to become the chef. Took the job. Uh, worked under the old owners for about eight years and my wife and I had a good uh, chance to buy the restaurant. Things have quieted down quite a bit over the past few decades at the Old South Mountain Inn. The events that occur aren't as spectacular as they were in Madame Dahlgren's day, but the things that do happen are just as eerie. One of the old cleaning ladies that were, was here probably back in the early 90s said she was here uh, she used to be here like 3 or 4 o'clock in the morning. She actually left her job that night and did not come back. It really freaked her out. She did return um, a couple days later, but it really shook her up, and she wasn't one to make stories up. She had worked here for, I believe it was 12 years prior to that and never had you know, any stories to tell, but that was one story that uh, st you know, stuck in my mind. It's widely believed that one of the spirits that still haunts the old South Mountain Inn is none other than Mrs. Madeline Dahlgren herself. The old mountain house and the area around South Mountain played quite an impact on Madame Dahlgren's life. So it's no wonder that the people who still work at the inn feel her spirit. Lisa Dorsey tells the story of one of her employees named George who perhaps felt too much of the spirit of Madame Dahlgren. He had said one day, he was back in the kitchen, he was just being obnoxious and he was taunting Lady Dahlgren basically was what it pulled down to. I'm telling you guys, no such thing as ghosts. What about Russ? He said he saw something upstairs last week. Yeah, right, whatever. I don't believe Russ one bit. He said he saw some like old lady walk around upstairs. Yeah, she was probably lost. She was probably trying to find the Somebody said he could see through her. I mean, you don't think it was like Madeline Dahlgren's ghost or something? No, I do not think it was Madeline Dahlgren's ghost. Besides, once you're dead and buried and gone, you're not coming back no matter what. I don't believe in ghosts, man. I'm telling you, once you're dead and gone, there's no coming back, no matter what. Man, I wouldn't be making her mad. She may do something to you. <laughs> yeah, right. I'd like to see that old broad do something to me. I dare that old broad to do something to me. I'd like to see that old broad do something to me. So he swears that that was what it was. It was because he was taunting Lady Dahlgren in a mean fashion that she kind of said, well, do it to me, I'll do it to you. And then I had another young lady that worked here. She was walking through the pantry. In the same area, called the cage room because of the storage containers, other employees have reported strange instances 
such as one employee who went in to get bar towels from one of the storage units. When he looked up, he was startled by a reflection of a woman in the glass window in the room. He told me it was an you know, old lady with gray hair and she had like a blue, old blue royal uh, dress on. Another employee went down to take inventory of the items in the room. As he walked in with his inventory sheet, he remembered that he had forgotten something to write with. Hey Blue, you got a pen? He laid the paper down and went back to the bar to get a pen. The bartender searched everywhere for the sheet of paper, but couldn't find it. All right, who's messing with me? Did another employee come into the room and take the paper? Or was it someone or something else? Some dinner guests have reported even seeing a ghostly apparition in one of the upstairs dining rooms, aptly called Lover's Lane. Before the patio was added on here, the, the garden room, apparently, and this was another story that I was told by a previous owner, that that was like Lady Dahlgren's widow peak, you know, years back when the when the widows were waiting for the sailors, they would pace that. And I've heard a lot of stories about people that have been here that have felt her presence in Lover's Lane because that's where she paced back and forth waiting for her husband. More sightings of ghostly shapes have been seen in other portions of the second story. The old secretary, probably back 92, 93, um, I was down in the kitchen doing my normal thing in the morning Old South Mountain Inn, how can I help you? Okay. Sure. Okay, you're all set. We'll see you tomorrow night at 7. Okay, bye. <gasps> Were you just upstairs? What? I thought it was just you messing with me. No, I've been out in the kitchen all the time. I saw something, something white out of the corner of my eye. You all right? I think I just saw a ghost. And she stayed with me by my side until uh, the old owner's Russian Judy got here because she, she swore that I was up there messing with her. She said she could hear footsteps, the doors were opening and closing, and she said that she thought she saw me coming around the corner in my white chef outfit, which I didn't even have it on that day. Finally, sightings of ghostly apparitions haven't been limited to the humans who work at the Old South Mountain Inn. My dog have a uh, Labrador. Uh, had it brought him to work with me one day, and I was uh, on the phone in one of my uh, offices upstairs, and he was laying in the, uh, the hallway there, and there's a, of course there's a window back behind me, and he's sitting there staring at me, and I'm on the phone, and next thing you know, I look over, and his hair standing straight up, and his ears go back. I'm thinking, you know, someone's outside on the ladder, my maintenance man. And then he starts, he starts barking like there's something wrong. He jumps up in my lap like he's scared. And I turn around and look to see what was going on. And I just, I felt like there was some, a presence behind me. I didn't know what it was, but, you know, I, I hear that animals have this strange uh, sense of knowing that there, there's something else beyond, you know, us there. So that was, that was quite, a, quite a feeling that day to have that happen. The old stone house, which sits on top of Turner's Gap, certainly has seen its share of history in its more than 250 years. Could it be that some of the history associated with the old South Mountain Inn is still trapped in some way within its walls? One thing is for certain. If you come to eat in one of the inn's many dining rooms, there is a slight chance you might be witness to some of the same people who enjoyed a hot meal and relaxing drink long ago. These stories that you've seen are just a small representation of the legends and strange occurrences in our area. 
These are stories passed down through the years, from family to family. Some still swear to their authenticity, while others dismiss them as merely entertaining stories. Myths and legends are critical to every society. That, uh, in essence, myths, religions, uh, legends, anything that can be used to explain the unexplainable becomes a central focus of many, many societies. Uh, obviously, in our very earliest societies where mankind knew almost nothing, uh, magic and myth and legend and religion became central to explain all sorts of things. Well, to me, legends are very important. Um, I'll explain that in just a minute. I think a legend itself, though, is probably a story that's unusual in its beginning, and then it gets told to someone else, and then that person embellishes it when they tell it to the third person, and then the story gets retold and maybe printed and then retranslated, and it goes back and forth. So. Uh, some months, uh, years later, that story is now completely different from what it was originally. But always at the center of the story, there's some truth. And I think it's important for the historians to take a look at legends and myths and, and try to cut through all, all the various uh, details that, that don't seem real and try to get to that, to that particular story and, and find out the exact truth. And by then, uh, when you get down to that one part of it that's true, uh, you can find the real story and might be something very interesting, very beneficial. Legends, legends are our folklore. Uh, they're sort of like the, the fabric that, that bind us together um, as a society. You know, it, it, it's, it's a common, uh, part of our common ancestry. And, you know, one of the things that's always fascinated me about Washington County and Western Maryland is the local history and the legends. And, uh, you know, they just, you don't have to travel far, you know, to be there. And to be actually standing at a spot like Fox's Gap and, you know, to, to have this, this great legend, uh, it, it, I just find it amazing. Legends are, are one of those kind of things that, uh, if, if nothing else, it piques people's interest. Uh, it gets their attention, they hear the story, and through that means, uh, hopefully, they will visit the site. While they're here, then again, hopefully, they'll get the rest of the story and find out more about the importance and the significance of the battlefield. It's interesting to note that in most legends, there's always a ghost lurking in the background. Tales of ghosts and the supernatural have been with us for centuries. European settlers brought with them their fear of ghosts and their superstitions when they came to the New World. What exactly is a ghost? Some believe that it's a soul trapped between the living world and the afterlife. Others believe it's energy from an event that's imprinted forever in the fabric of time, while others think that ghosts are energies transmitted by the living. No matter what you believe, ghost stories will always be a part of our culture and our lives, with the one thing that ties them all together, the history of our community. So now, when you drive past that old house on your way to work, will you think about the history surrounding it? Or the next time you feel a cold breeze that chills your spine, or hear sounds behind you that make you spin around only to see a cloud of mist, will you dismiss it as you've done before, or will a vague, uneasy feeling that you might not be alone come over you? Maybe there's a legend there. <laughs>